Up next, we have Phil Lindsley. Um, he is widely recognized in the area of Medi-Cal and public benefits planning, special needs planning, asset protection, and planning for long-term care and limits his practice to this area. He is a certified elder law attorney and certified legal specialist in estate planning, trust, and probate law. So go ahead, Phil. Thank you. Welcome, welcome here at lunchtime. What a great crowd. Thank you all for uh, coming uh, th and thank you for the introduction. If you'd like to know a little bit more about us and our firm, the second page of your handout has uh, uh, a bit about us, myself, and about the firm. Um, but, you know, you didn't come to hear about me, so I'm going to skip over that. <laughs> I will say this, though, that uh, despite having been in practice for... Uh, frankly, approaching 40 years now in this general area, um, and getting a lot of knowledge through experience and book learning, probably the single most important thing that helped me do what I do now is caring for my own father, who had Alzheimer's. Um, he, uh, I had him come and live with me uh, for the last eight years of his life when it was getting clear that he needed more support than he was getting living on his own. Unfortunately for me, he was willing to do that. Uh, he was still fairly active when he first came there. Uh, he still was driving, which I fixed pretty soon. Uh, yeah, I actually had to uh, pull out the spark plugs. Uh, he never knew I did that, bless his heart. Um, but uh, what I went through over the next years, as he diminished uh, at times pretty precipitously, I mean, he ended up basically uh, fully uh, uh, non-ambulatory, unable to do any transfers, incontinent, and fairly demented. Uh, and so that was a progression. I learned a lot. Many of you are in the process of learning a lot. Some of you are on the front end of learning a lot. Uh, some of you are uh, finished on that and, and hopefully will not be called upon to do that again, but may. So uh, this is the challenge of caregivers. I dedicate this to all the caregivers out there. And hopefully this is knowledge that will uh, help you. So we have five tips today. Um, the first two are a little depressing. They're more uh, urging you to understand the nature of the problem. But I promise after these first couple of tips, uh, we'll start talking about solutions and things that I think uh, you uh, will need to know. Uh, since we have so much to uh, cover, I'll try to avoid taking questions during this. But I tell you, we have a table right over there in the uh, uh, vendor area near the fountain. Uh, so, and I have like, uh, we have five of us there today, uh, a staff ready to answer any questions and some useful literature over there as, uh, as well. So, tip one, understand the nature of your problem and the nature of the challenge. Uh, and it is a challenge. It's a challenge to be a caregiver because of the nature of our long-term care system. Here's another challenge, by the way, in the airport. But, um, and we're going to talk more about that, but typically, you know, what's going to happen is at a point in time, the caregiver, the family who is tending to a spouse, tending to a parent, uh, no longer is going to be able to, by themselves, meet the burden. I mean, as long as they can, that's fine. You can almost pretend this isn't happening. But at some point in time, that falls apart, and you need to start turning to a system outside assistance, other people, other agencies, maybe other facilities. We talk, we call that the long-term care maze because at that point in time when the family has to turn outward, you start bumping into things that you don't know and that you wish you knew and you are learning quickly. So this maze overwhelms families pretty quickly uh, and uh, you know, it usually, when I say overwhelms, if there's a primary caregiver, that's the person that's most likely to be getting overwhelmed and wondering, what do I do? How do I deal with these things? 
and it all seems like a bunch of disconnected puzzle pieces. Here's just some samples right here. Mom has dementia. Well, we had to move to a retirement community. What do we do with a condo? Uh, what do we do with this insurance policy? Should we keep paying it? Mom was a nurse. Could she get any help from the VA in the Army? Any help from the VA? How do I resolve care issues with mom's long-term care provider? I'm the executor of her will. Can I write checks? I mean, there's just a whole bunch of checks, questions, and they're related on care questions, they're related on financial, and they're related to legal. And they all seem kind of disjointed. Well, my main message here is that you can't really look at them as a bunch of disjointed issues. You have to learn to look at them as several things that are working at the same time, but you need to analyze them together. And we talk about this sometimes as life care planning. And what it does is it recognizes different things are happening, and there are different professionals and different areas that you need to know about. First, health. At some point in time, I mean, at the beginning of this journey, people will be uh, uh, ambulatory and cooperative and not have much dependence. As they progress, there'll be an increasing amount of dependence, and at some point in time, there may be full dependence. Another thing that is happening at the same time is questions and concerns about placement. Perhaps we start out in the home with just family. Maybe we now at some point in time, because the burden's too much, just for the family, the caregiver, reaching outside, respite care, additional care, maybe a, a facility, an assisted living or board and care. Is in, and at the far end of the spectrum, we have SNF stands for skilled nursing facility. Now, not everybody is going to require skilled nursing care, uh, but many will. More people than then we have payment issues. How are we paying for this? Well, when somebody's at home and spouse is taking care of them, there is no extra payment beyond the normal burden. But as time goes on and you need to bring other people and other resources, start getting some respite care. Uh, you know, expenses start going up. Certainly they go up if there's a, uh, you're paying at an assisted living facility, uh, having to turn to uh, whatever resources you can get there, whether they're uh, public benefits programs, your own resources, community resources, and finally at the end payment, if somebody is on Medi-Cal, uh, that's, you know, $8,500 a month and up, excuse me, uh, for skilled nursing care. At that end, uh, if you can get Medi-Cal to pay for it, that helps. We're going to look at that later. And legal docs. I mean, as an attorney, I would do very different legal docs for somebody if they were still at the home, in the home, and I knew they could likely be in the home for a, a, a few years than I would if, frankly, it was obvious that somebody's probably going to be in skilled nurse, nursing within a matter of a few months. But I don't know. I don't know how to assess that. So I need to work with other professionals. And the other professionals should understand that too. So your challenge is work with, number one, understand yourself that it is going to get best results if you are thinking about these things together, even if each group of professionals is thinking about their own part. We have uh, a client, so when we do life care planning for people, we are helping them plug into professionals that we know work together. But whether or not you use a life care planning attorney, please understand and let your takeaway be that you need, you'll get best results if you think about this as an integrated thing and getting your people working together. Analyzing payment in terms of placement, in terms of level of health, get people talking to each other. Then these puzzle pieces that we looked before start coming together. You get the right legal surfaces. You get the right asset protection plan. You get the right providers. You understand that. So that was tip one. Understand the challenges and work together. Closely related to that, really kind of a part of that, is my two. Understand the difference between acute care and chronic care issues, and how Medicare and health insurance problems treat those differently. Now, we have actually a very good acute care health system. 
And from the standpoint of the consumer, you don't have to know a lot. You break your leg, you go to urgent care, you go to the hospital, they'll tell you now we're taking, now you're going to get this x-ray, now you're going to get some blood drawn, now you're going to, this is going to happen. It's kind of like stepping on an escalator. You kind of go through the system, you don't need to know a lot, people know what they are doing and they tell you, and, it's, and, and two people going through the same thing are going to have very much the same results. So acute crisis, what's an acute crisis? Well, like a broken leg, like a heart attack, like a stroke, anything that brings you into a hospital, again, uh, you might need to be turned down to touch, but I'm not sure. Um, so acute care is reactive, as the slide says. It's not designed to support you in the day-to-day self-management. It's uh, when, again, you have an event and the healthcare system is responding to that acute crisis. So as I said, you don't need to know a lot to go to the hospital and get your issue taken care of and which tests need to be done. If you have a chronic care issue, that's much different. I use the analogy of acute care, going to the hospital, like stepping on an escalator. If you have a chronic care problem, that's not so much like an escalator. It's more like being at the foot of a wilderness trail with a faded map that has coffee spilled all over it. It might be in another language. Uh, so your results, if you're dealing with a chronic care issue, are going to vary greatly based on what you know, how good an advocate you are, or who you have working with you and how a good advocate they are. Because now, with a chronic care issue, it's all about teamwork, it's all about management, it's all about working it. Care planning with an interdisciplinary team, ongoing assess and follow up. It's focused on keeping you healthy and at home. Now, and again, two people have very different results. One person who is just not doing this and doesn't have any advocates is going to get very poor follow-up care. Another person that has some people that are tracking this and working this for them is going to have much better results. So sometimes, I mean, you're going to switch. You have an acute crisis, it could morph into chronic. So you have that stroke. Well, during the time after your stroke, you go to the hospital, they give you a TPA shot, they uh, deal with you, you get discharged for some aggressive uh, follow-up therapy and then you get sent home. Well, it's at that point when you get sent home, still perhaps suffering from disabilities and challenges. That's the transition point where you find out that your insurance policy and your Medicare is not doing what it was doing when you had an acute crisis. So Medicare, and the big problem here is the way that our healthcare system responds to acute versus chronic care. Medicare is an acute care program. Often people don't realize the limits because they don't bump into them. And when you do bump into them, uh, it it's, can be a rude wake up. Uh, for example, if you uh, uh, are hospitalized for three days and then discharged to skilled nursing for follow-up care, that's covered under your Part A part of your medic, but only for a limited time, maximum 100 days. And for other reasons, it usually stops after 20 or 30 days. At that point, there's no more Medicare. Similar result with your health care policy, very similar results. Um, so they'll cover what's as long as it's acute, but when it transitions into a chronic care, you're either private paying uh, you might, some people might have a long-term care policy, which might help, but you're, at that point in time, you're looking at paying yourself or accessing any benefits programs that you might be eligible for. We'll take a closer look at that as well. But again, it's important to understand that challenge, the difference between how the insurance you think you can rely on responds to chronic care issues. So. Don't get discouraged then, as I said. Uh, tip one and two were uh, challenges, problems. 
Tips three, four, and five are about solutions. So let's start looking about how you can get yourself set up to uh, address these issues as best you can and meet the challenges of chronic care. So tip three, get the right tools in the toolbox. At least maximize your ability to deal or your uh, family ability to deal with these challenges as they happen. When I'm talking about planning here now, I'm talking about estate planning, making sure you have the right legal documents, and they are the right kinds of legal documents, and they have the right language. There are some particular challenges that come from somebody that is likely to have chronic care conditions. So there is uh, um, challenges above and beyond normal estate planning that you want to make sure that your plan is adequately addressed. So if you don't have a good, uh, if you don't have an estate plan, what happens? Well, I tell people an estate plan is like, uh, you get to write the rules for how your assets, how your estate is managed, under what terms and conditions. Pretty liberal as to what you can do. But if you don't do anything, then you don't get to decide. So well, if you do planning, you can decide who would be managing your finances if you no longer can. If you don't do that, it might be somebody else. It might not be the person, the person who jumps up and says, I'll do it. And if you didn't spell out who you wanted to do it, may not be the person that you would have wanted to do it. And if you don't say another option is the courts might have to decide who that is. Same thing happens for healthcare decisions. If you or your family member hasn't made adequate choices or isn't in a position anymore to make adequate choices, uh, then uh, you may need the court intervention uh, to be able to make healthcare decisions. And again, that should be unnecessary with good planning. Near and dear to my heart is if you've got a good state plan that has long-term care planning language in it that's going to help in dealing with chronic care conditions and qualifying for any benefits programs, uh, we can get that language in the estate plan. If that's not there, then it's not there. Uh, and we have to deal with that as best we can. That's why I keep using the metaphor about tools in the toolbox. I mean, I want all the tools I can have. When a client comes in and it's in a crisis, I like to look at their plan and find everything that we would need. That's great. Not always is the case. So again, tools in the toolbox. If I've got a nail, I want to find a hammer. I don't want to look in this toolbox and be trying to pound the nail in with the back end of a flashlight. Might work, not going to work as well. So another option, another problem from not having it is other people will decide who will be administering your estate, what will happen after you die, and who would inherit your property. None of those things are probably what you would want to have. So here's the solution, what we call an integrated estate plan. You probably all have heard of trusts. And indeed, most people, certainly if you own a home, you would benefit from a trust. Now, you don't have to own a home to benefit from a trust. Now, everybody thinks, oh, well, trust, and we avoid probate. Well, that's true. But, uh, and I certainly think that's a, an important reason to have a trust, but another very important reason is a trust offers a much easier way to manage assets for you, not when you die, but when you're disabled. Trying to run your life through a power of attorney is much more problematic than somebody simply stepping in as your successor trustee. There's technical reasons for that, but I'm going to ask you to take my word on that. So a trust is kind of like a box. It only has what you in it, what you put in it. I call that funding the trust. Um, that's a challenge, by the way, as a firm that does administration. We have a lot of people come in with trust when something's hit the fan, and we open it up and we find, well, that's a lovely, lovely trust, but there's no property in it. You never transferred any property to this trust. So it's pretty useless at that point. And they go, oh my gosh, we spent all this money. It was so good. And I go, yes, it's an excellent trust, but it's an empty trust. So you've got to make sure you've got your property in the trust. Once it's in the trust, it is managed by the trustee. Now, when you set up your own trust, you're going to be the owner of the trust, and you're going to be the manager, the trustee. 
and you'll be the beneficiary. You might not always be the trustee. You might become incapacitated. You may not want to do it anymore. Certainly you won't be after you die. You will need a successor trustee. So the trustee is the person who manages the assets in the trust during your lifetime and after your death. But the trustee has no power over assets that aren't in the trust, and there may be assets that aren't in the trust, either because they were forgotten to be put in the trust, or there are some types of assets that you cannot place in a trust during your life, uh, and that you would need that a power of attorney. Now, the person who is in charge of the power of attorney, we call the agent. The person you appoint to be your agent, and you need them, somebody to step up because you can't do it yourself. So the agent under the power of attorney has no authority over property in the trust. The trustee has no authority over property outside of the trust. So this is why there is no one legal document that accomplishes everything. I wish there were, but there's not. We need a group of documents to cover the waterfront here. Just as you can see during your life, two documents, the trust, for property in the trust and the power of attorney for property outside of the trust. Now the power of attorney only lasts as long as you do. On your death, it vanishes, poof. But if you think you can go after somebody passes and use their power of attorney to deal with the assets, you're in for a big disappointment. At that point in time, uh, a document called a pour over will. Uh, it will uh, essentially uh, it is there as a safety net and it takes any doc if you have a trust it says please take any documents that weren't in the trust and give it and give it to the trust transfer it into the trust so but you see right there so that's three documents property inside the trust and property outside of the trust financial power of attorney and the poor over will then there's your health care decision make that's the fourth document your health care power of attorney where you appoint the person that you would want to make health care decisions for you and also in the part that we refer to as the advanced health care directive or the living will an opportunity to say things you want them to know how you would want them to respond uh, uh, if uh, you were on life support and the like and whatever other uh, considerations you would want to put in there you could put them in and that's binding on your agent um, so that's it. That's the four documents, uh, four key documents uh, for the uh, uh, integrated estate plan. There are various other ancillary documents that are part of that. Um, so if you already have an estate plan uh, or your family member that you are a caregiver for, I mean, really, it's the caregivers you can't go out and make the estate plan you wish you had, right, uh, for your parents. Your parents already did that and they gave it to you, kind of fait accompli, you're having to deal with what you have. I hope you have good tools in the, one, I hope you have the estate plan and I hope you have tools in the toolbox. If you're not so sure, and they still may have the legal capacity, enough understanding to address that issue, well, that's a good, potential action item for you to have that review to make sure it is the uh, quality uh, that you would want it to be because it is you, the caregiver, that's going to have to deal with any, any insufficiencies in that estate plan and that burden is going to fall on you. There are still things you can do, uh, but the choice is, again, back to my toolbox, you have less tools than that and uh, some of the ones become a little more challenging and more expensive to deal with with inadequate planning. Even if you have a good estate plan, uh, if there's a chronic care issue out there, you're going to want to make sure it has adequate public benefits language. Uh, there's a lot of language that uh, elder law attorneys like to see in estate plans that isn't in a lot of estate plans, particularly in the powers of attorney that allow us to do some of the things that we would like to be able to do to help ensure qualification and eligibility for some of the public assistance programs. The other, while I have you here for a few minutes, uh, and if you're able to go back and pull out that trust and look at it, um, that alerts you to the issue of what we call AB trusts or bypass trusts. There's a lot of trusts out there that have this 
structure in it where on, when the first spouse dies, the trust is divided in half and two trusts are created from that. Now there was a reason for that. It had to do with something called federal estate tax. Uh, it used to be if you had uh, more than $600,000, you were probably going to have to pay federal estate tax. That was the exemption, $600,000 at one point in time. So if you had a $1 million estate, 400000 of it would be subject to federal estate tax. And it was about a 50% tax. So that's $200,000, poof, gone. So people wanted to make sure that they got each person's exemption. 600 and 600. Now you got 1.2 million. Oh, our million dollar estate is covered. So these trusts that split into two are very common in older estate plans. They did a good job. They had their problems and their burdens. They, you, independent legal entity, you have to file tax returns for them. The assets aren't as available for the surviving spouse. There were things, but when you were saving 200,000, that was those were small prices to pay. The exemption for federal estate tax now for a married couple is $22 million. <laughs> now, if there's anybody out there that has more than that, I want to be your attorney. <laughs> but I'm guessing that isn't a lot of us. So, in other words, we don't need this language in our estate plans anymore, and it's actually getting in the way is creating burdens, problems, ish, unnecessary issues, and it's particularly getting in the way of some of the planning we do. Now these bypass trusts or this two trust structure, I'm talking about it not working or not being necessary for tax reasons. There still are reasons people might want to do that, and your classic one is the blended family where each side wants to make sure, okay, when the first spouse dies, I don't want the surviving spouse to be able to disinherit uh, their other spouse's kids and leave everything to their kids. We want to make sure at least, okay. So yeah, okay, now you got a good reason for that. But most people who have these and the lingering in their older estate plans don't have that reason. So that's another thing to be aware of. So just because you have an estate plan doesn't mean you have the right one. So, this next tip is probably the most important one uh, I will give today about the long-term care medical program. And uh, I give talks on this hour, an hour and a half long. So I'm just doing it as a bullet point today. Uh, but if what I say in about the next 15, 20 minutes, I'm gonna spend some time on this one, uh, makes sense to you, please try to find out more about it. We have more information, we even have uh, in office presentations uh, on this program. But let me uh, essentially outline some of the general uh, parts of this and see if it makes sense for you. Um, it relates to the, back to what I said about the challenges of chronic care. How do you pay for chronic care issues? Medicare is not going to. So here's the problem here on the, the care. If you look, remember back to my continuum of you know, where people were and placement and finances and legal documents, well, so at the early stage, again, as I said before, you start at home, maybe you need some additional supportive services and the expense, maybe independent living. RCFE stands for Residential Care Facilities for the Elderly. Those are uh, essentially uh, assisted living facilities and board and cares, which are the little residential six places. Both of them are considered at the same level of licensing. And then in the top here, actual medical facilities or skilled nursing facilities. Um, the program I'm gonna talk about, Long-Term Care Medi-Cal, only covers care at skilled nursing. So that's a limitation. And yet, many people will end up needing that kind of care, and private paying, as I said before, is about $8,500 a month plus. So uh, that's something where uh, even if you would never need it, I think it's important to understand the program because you may not know whether life is going to have this happen with the person you're caring for, whether or not they're going to get so debilitated at some point in time that you just no longer can adequately care for them at home, 
either because of just the care needs or the cost of the level of assistance you need at home. Uh, or they may not be able to function at assisted living anymore, and the facility itself may say, we just cannot, this person has too many medical needs, is too debilitating. Uh, has too much dementia, too much, uh, they have diabetes and they're not monitoring themselves and we can't do that, we're not nurses. So you can end up there and it's nice to know where you are in relation to that program because it's always been my feeling if I can show somebody what we call the snapshot, if I can show somebody that okay, when you get to this part where you assume it's going to be most expensive, Here's actually a program you'd be eligible for, and here's what it really will end up costing you. If that information uh, is surprising, uh, sometimes that, I think, frees up people to think, well, we don't have to save everything we thought we had to deal with these issues back here. Maybe we can get a little more caregiving help in the home and try to stretch that out. So, for the next few minutes, we're going to take a look at this program. Uh, we're going to take a look at the rules as they apply to a single individual, an unmarried individual, and I'm also going to discuss some special rules that apply to married people. Uh, and I will identify which ones are applying only to a spouse, but those are particularly ones. Medicare, as I said, is an acute care program. It's only going to pay for a skilled nursing facility after a three-day hospital stay and for a maximum of 100 days. And again, for other reasons, they usually tell you after 20 or 30 days that Medicare is not going to pay anymore. Um, so who else pays for skilled nursing? Well, people say, well, I have Kaiser, or I have a Medigap policy, or I have a Medicare Advantage plan. It's not going to add a single day. Might pick up some of the share of costs if you have either of those type of structures, but it's not going to turn an acute care program into a chronic care program. If you have long-term care insurance, that might offer some assistance. Usually the policies we see are rather limited. They have caps. They have monthly caps that are usually about half the cost of the facility. Uh, so they're not, uh, usually they're not a complete solution. They might help. But more to the point, most people don't have them. At least private paying, as I said, $8,8500 a month. Well, that's when this program can step in for a lot of people. Unlike the other Medi-Cal programs, this is not a poverty-based program. This has substantial middle class protection and benefits. See, a lot of people who have no idea that they would be eligible for this program uh, that don't, uh, that are surprised. May or may not be you, but um, first of those interesting things is there is no income test. All the other Medi-Cal programs, eligibility, in, your income is part of your eligibility. And if you have more than a very modest amount of income, you will not be eligible. There is no income test for this program. It doesn't matter what your income. Income, a part of determining what we call share of costs, that is whether or not you have to pay a portion of the skilled nursing fee, but it has nothing to do with eligibility. Eligibility is solely determined on assets, and we're going to look at that in a, in a minute. And then I mentioned the special spousal protection rules, too. Uh, when I started doing this, which was quite a while ago, um, pre-1988, if you had a, a spouse that came in and said, my, my husband is in a skilled nursing facility, um, uh, you know, I am worried he's gonna live a year and a half or so there, what we're paying will be wiped out, our life savings will be gone, and then what happens to me? Well, that was a concern. There were a lot of sp spouses who were being left impoverished without a penny after paying for the care of their spouse. Well, that's. In 1988, Congress decided, bipartisan, another point of why it was so long ago, right? You know, uh, but part of, they actually came together and everybody said, well, that's not a good result. So they uh, established these files of protection rules. Um, what could I tell somebody pre-1988? Well, you might consider getting divorced. Maybe we could save half of it. 
which was a horrible thing to advise somebody who'd been married 50 years, 60 years. You know, that seemed like abandonment at the worst possible time. Fortunately, that's not the case anymore. We never have to tell any, recommend divorce as a way of health care planning anymore uh, with these files of protection rules. But we're going to look at some of those rules for those of you where there is a, what we call a community spouse, an at-home spouse, uh, some of those rules uh, as well. In a nutshell, there's two main ones. One is an asset benefit for the spouse, and the other is an income, how they treat income, if there is a spouse. Now again, right here in this slide, I'm only talking about uh, if there is a spouse. Um, well, actually, you know what? I'm going to come back to this slide. I'm going to go to the next slide first. Let's look, and this slide is for everybody, single or otherwise. When they're examining the asset test, they don't look at all properties. Some property is considered exempt or not counted. The home is exempt. It doesn't matter how much equity you have in that home. It is not counted. Very poorly understood, even unfortunately by eligibility workers and a lot of professionals out there, is the treatment of IRAs, 401ks, 403bs, all your retirement accounts. They are exempt. If there is a spouse, they are considered exempt. And for if there's a single person or the institutionalized person, they are considered unavailable if they're in payout. And they always can be placed in payout. So this means, in essence, Pension accounts, IRAs, none of these accounts are ever counted against you for eligibility. So they're all over as exempt assets. Certain annuities are exempt. Uh, business property is exempt. After you decide what all the exempt property is, if there's a single person, just a single unmarried person, they can only have $2,000 of countable assets. If there's a spouse, they can have another additional 123,600. And we're going to show you how that number can get substantially increased. So again, I keep saying, this is not a poverty-based program. Let me go back here to this slide. Again, as I said, if there is a spouse, in addition to all the exempt property, in addition to the house and all the IRAs and any uh, those of business property, any of those other assets, um, he or she would get to keep $123,000 and sometimes more. Um, there is another uh, an asset test too called the Monthly Maintenance Needs Allowance or MEMNA. This year that is $3,090. If, if the community spouse's income, and I mean her own income, disregarding her spouse's income, it's either, more, it's either that amount or more, or it's less. If it is less than that, then she is allowed to ask for a higher community spouse resource allowance, and there's a formula. We're going to look at that one more time. Not a poverty-based program. So, so what are the strategies if you do that and somebody uh, has more assets than they're eligible for? Well. Um, you know, if you're taking a snapshot ahead of time, maybe, as I said a few minutes ago, that'll free you up to get some more in-home care when it can help. Uh, there are some asset transfer strategies. Never, ever, ever try to do those yourself, and they, don't, they often don't work, and there's problems, and there are penalties. Uh, the time we have today, I'm not going to go into that in any detail, other than to say don't, unless you have a competent elder law attorney working with you. Um, you always can convert assets that are countable, however, into assets that aren't countable. So there's a lot of planning strategies. So let's take a look at a sample family, see how this works. So here's John and Mary Smith. They have a home. I should update this slide. These homes are... Uh, yeah, yeah. All 400 square feet of it. Uh, they have a couple of CDs. They have, uh, as you can see down here, they have uh, uh, a couple of IRAs. Life insurance policy. Um, life insurance is only counted at its cash surrender value. If it's a term policy, it's not counted. 
If it's a whole life policy, it's not counted as death benefit, only it's cash surrender value. Uh, if they have a piece of real estate other than their house, there's another interesting little uh, counting rule. Uh, it's not counted at its fair market value. It's counted at its assessed value. Now, if you bought your home recently, yeah, that's probably going to be the same. But if mom and dad bought their home in 1961, uh, the assessed value is going to be a heck of a lot less than this. So you could have an assessed value of $75,000 and a fair market value of $575,000. They would only count that as $75,000. I've had people come in where they have, you know, home, and a, uh, a second income property home, uh, pension plans, and then maybe $20,000. At $20,000 plus the assessed value of $75,000 is less than the security spouse resource allowance. A family with much could be qualified walking into the office without me helping with a thing, and they would have no idea. Uh, but these counting rules can work for you. So let's. When somebody sees me for the snapshot, I draw a line right down the center of a legal paper and I separate, okay, these things are counted, these things are not. <coughs> Excuse me. Bad part of the lab lines. The home, not counted. One car was not counted. They had two cars. I put the more expensive car on the, not, on the exempt side. Uh, the IRAs are over there. Uh, the Fidelity Fund, uh, I made sure that there's no pension money in there, or I already included it over here. Uh, the second car, a CD. The life insurance is at its uh, cash surrender value only, not its death benefit. And Palmdale is at its assessed value, not at its fair market value. So here's how this works out. They have $166,000. If you add up the things on that right-hand column, that's what it would come up to. So, subtracting Mary's community spouse resource allowance, the $2,000 that the person in the facility is allowed to hit their credit. So they have about $40,000 excess assets. Well, that's not too bad. That's not too bad. You know, this graphic is because I call this low-hanging fruit. What would we do? Well. If they still have a mortgage on that, it could be as simple as paying off $40,000 with the principal. Write a single check. They're now eligible. If the home's free and clear, maybe it has some deferred maintenance. You can do some repairs. Burial plans are exempt. A new vehicle is exempt. There's a $40,000 would not be hard to accelerate eligibility. And what we're trying to do here when we're doing this kind of planning is avoiding a spend down. A spend down is when you just private pay until it's all gone and let the, uh, let the problem solve itself that way. There is almost always something better to do than that, like these things. If it was more than $40,000, let us say change the hypothetical and say Mary and John had $350,000 excess assets. Well, again, for a married couple, I would look and see if uh, we're eligible to raise her community spouse resource allowance. And let me show you how that's done. I told you about both the resource allowance and the MIMNA. If Mary's income is less, and her income only, again, as I said, disregard child, just her income, her social security, her teacher's pension, if that is less than $3,090, she is eligible to get a higher community spouse resource allowance. The thought being, and the public policy behind it being, is if your income is low, what do you need? You need more assets to generate, to earn you income until you have your monthly income is enough uh, that you reach the benchmark. This benchmark this year is 3,090. I don't know where they get these numbers. They change it every year, but that is the number that the federal government has determined that would be nice for an at-home spouse to have of their own income. So if she's left than that, she gets to ask for a larger community spouse resource allowance. And there's a formula. It's a set formula. There's not a lot of guesswork to this. Um, so basically, as I said, the MIMNA is 3,090. Let's say, make the math easy, Mary's 
Social Security and pension is $2,090, so she's got $1,000 a month less than the benchmark. So she is eligible to ask for a higher community spouse resource allowance. $1,000 a month, that's $12,000 a year, right? So the question is, how much capital, how much money at prevailing interest rates is needed to make her $12,000? Well, the answer to that at prevailing interest rates, prevailing CD rates, is a lot of money. So, here's Mary. I say in my hypothetical here, Mary's income is $1,690. Uh, so, that's $1,400 a month under $16,000 a year. If she could find a CD paying 2.5%, it would take $672,000 for her to be able to earn the income she's entitled to. She could get, therefore, her community spouse resource allowance raised for that amount. And I say if you could find a CD paying 2.5%, if you can only find a CD, and you can't, <laughs> if you can only find a CD paying less than that, you would actually, that number would be higher, not lower. Whatever that number is, that's the amount you are allowed the spouse is allowed for their community spouse resource allowance. And again, assuming you could find a CD, here are what Mary's actual income is and what she could keep as a property reserve. So I'll just let you absorb that for a moment. This is not a poverty-based program. And again, with some specially potent rules uh, if there is an at-home spouse. Now, there's a process to get this done if it fits with the family. Uh, the eligibility worker cannot raise the community spouse resource allowance. You have to go to a hearing. Uh, but again, it's pretty formulaic. We do that a lot. So your takeaway, really, on this program is uh, on long-term care Medi-Cal. There are a lot of assets that aren't counted. There's a lot of planning opportunities to prevent somebody from just having to private pay until it's gone, to get eligibility a lot faster than that. And if there is a spouse and their income is less than $3,000 or whatever the MIMNA is that year, we almost always can get them eligible for this program because of the formula that's used. So one more time, this is not a poverty-based program. It has substantial benefits for lots of people that have no idea, no idea. I guarantee you there are a thousand people in this county, thousands of people, who would be eligible for this program and have no idea, and are just private paying and wasting a lifetime of assets and not taking a look at this. So if we're doing a, an advanced planning, uh, that's good. Honestly, most of what we do at San Diego Elwood Law Center is crisis planning. That's human nature. What we usually define as a crisis is we get a phone call, uh, you know, somebody's either in the hospital and getting sent to skilled nursing, or they've been in the hospital, they've gotten sent to skilled nursing, and now skilled nursing is trying to give them the heave-ho, and uh, they don't think that's a good idea. I mean, that's a crisis a lot we can do in those scenarios. Um, but again, as I said before, if we can touch this family and these issues earlier, we can make sure we have uh, perhaps add tools to the toolbox so we can address the fact that most family trusts uh, don't have the language in them that we want, that we have these trusts with these AB trusts in them that actually get in the way for this type of planning, and that most powers of attorney do not have the authority we want. I'll take a moment and explain that. In California, um, there is a statute. I mean, you can have a power of attorney that says, this is a general power of attorney. I give my agent the authority to do absolutely everything I could do myself. And you as a lay person would think, well, that should cover it. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, no, it doesn't. There are uh, seven things that are considered so significant that you have to particularly spell them out in certain language. And one of them is to do the type of asset transfers between spouses or between family that we might want to do in benefits planning. If it isn't in there, 
specifically spelled out, you cannot do it. And that can be a problem. So, so yes, solution, integrated estate plan with benefits preserving life. So my last, so that's the fourth tip. Our last tip has to do with your rights in the healthcare system, particularly your rights in skilled nursing. Um, that's something I would like you to know, or at least to know that you have some rights. So I'm going to slightly radicalize you here today. Uh, so if you follow that scenario, some uh, family members in the hospital are getting discharged to skilled nursing, um, what happens then? Well, if they rehabilitate sufficiently to come back home and that makes sense for the family, well, then that's what we would all want. Um, but, you know, you have to understand that the interest of the facilities may not be exactly the same as the family's interest. These are businesses. Over the uh, time I've practiced, I've watched these go from mostly family businesses to uh, most of them are now corporate. Uh, there's a lot of pressures at, at the corporation for every year to have higher and higher um, earnings per bed, is what they refer to it. If, you, if your job is you're an administrator of this facility, you want to show rising dollars per bed per year. That's how you're measure. That's how you get raises or fire. And there's a kind of a, you know, the culture in corporations is every year higher, higher, excelsior. So you don't want to be the person that shows a flat year, let alone a year where the earnings per bed has declined. So there's a lot of pressure. Uh, the fact of the matter is uh, these facilities will earn the most dollars per bed on Medicare. Medicare will only pay for a limited amount of time. So let's say the average is 20, 30 days. So what they would like to see, or you would like to see, if that was your job to be the administrator of these facilities, is 20 days in, out, next, 20 days, out, next, 20 days, out, next. That's how you get your best numbers. But actually, you have a right to stay there in many situations, and they're not going to necessarily tell, matter of fact, not necessarily, they will not tell you what your rights are because they want 20 days out, 20 days out. So most discharges from skilled nursing are considered voluntary. They are highly inspected and they're fairly highly regulated, and they got to keep charts and records, and they have to record whether this discharge was voluntary or involuntary because there are different things they have to do if it's involuntary. So what constitutes a voluntary discharge? We're sending your dad home tomorrow at 10 o'clock, ready. You figure, oh well, that's what I gotta do. And you pull the car up and maybe they help you get dad in the back seat and that's that. Uh, that is a voluntary discharge. I mean, at least that's how it's coded. So. We're going to take a look at what really should be happening. If you convert to Medi-Cal, that's not a ground for discharge. As a matter of fact, under California law, they can't, not only can they not discharge you for doing that, they can't even change your room. And say, oh, you've got a really cool room next to the nurse's station. We're going to move you to the lower Slobovia. <laughs> Doesn't work. Most facilities, not all facilities, long-term care medical, but most nursing facilities in San Diego do. If you say, well, wait a minute, I, I, I'm not so sure we're going, then you have converted it to an involuntary discharge. And there are only six reasons under the law, if you stand your ground, that they can discharge you. The first one is that you no longer need that level of care. Well, that's probably not the case. You know, if you have, uh, uh, you know, if dad has gotten into the hospital and mom was barely able to take care of him before, he weighs 200 pounds, she's 98, he needs help in transfers, uh, I mean, he's a handful, I mean, he may be where he's supposed to be. 
Um, they may have a different idea on that, but if they have any skill, dementia, any skill that they can stay. The second reason is they need a higher level of care. They need to go back to the hospital or the acute care system. Well, that's not likely what the case is either. These little red codes, by the way, they mean they need your doctor to sign off on that. They can't just decide that. Your doctor has to agree with them. The health of the individuals would otherwise be in danger. Mom has the plague. Okay. The safety of individuals is in danger. Mom punches people in the nose as frequently as she can. Well, but if those, you know, if they don't meet these tests, they cannot discharge her. They must keep them and provide the same level of care. So what are not grounds for discharge? We don't have any custodial beds. There is no such thing. That's a common statement. We are a rehabilitation only facility. That's not true. I mean, that might be their marketing program because they want that 20 days, 20 days, 20 days. They are licensed as a skilled nursing facility. They must provide all the services under their license. They cannot involuntarily discharge you. Again, for obvious financial reasons, they may not educate you on this. <laughs> Medicare isn't paying anymore. That may be true, but that is not grounds for a discharge. Uh, and if you can qualify for the Medi-Cal program I just told you about, you know, again, they're not going to tell you about this, but you have the absolute right to stay. If you have a family member in one of these facilities and they say, you know, you know, they wander around a lot, they yell, this is, and we think we know a better place for them. You don't have to accept that. Everybody has to be somewhere, right? I mean, everybody's got to be somewhere. They are licensed to provide that level of care. They may want to treat your father as a hot potato because of behavioral issues, uh, but, you know, no. You have the right to say no. In addition, they've got to do, they have an obligation under the law to do discharge planning, proper discharge planning. They're not going to tell you a lot about this either, which requires that they consult with you, the family, involve you in the process. This is where you get a chance to tell them things they don't want to know. Like, mom wasn't able to take care of dad before he fell and broke his hip. They go, me, 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 don't tell us. Then we have to own that for discharge. Well, then we can't send them home. Uh, but it's your job to make sure that they do know what they need to know and insist on intelligent discharge planning. I strongly recommend, by the way, that people at this point, if you're getting pushback, you retain, you hire a nurse or social worker case manager to help you. The social workers and the director of nursing at the facilities are not necessarily on your side. They may be, they're being paid by the people who want the 20 day rollover, right? So you may want to consider hiring somebody to give you the straight shot and help you see, well, are they right or are they just kind of talking their pocketbook? Uh, so be ready to do that. They've got to do orientation, post-discharge planning, uh, even if they are going home, they have obligations to adjust. So, in summary of this, if your facts are appropriate about a discharge, just say no. We have a magazine over at our, our uh, table called Insights on Elder Care that we put out. Uh, I have an article in there about this uh, They're called Just Say No. Uh, your rights. But people are going home, I'm seeing people all the time, they come into my office and they are back home and they had no idea that they could have stayed. Or at least say, well, wait a minute, we'd like to talk about some discharge planning. We've got some questions. Uh, and if you have to file an appeal to make this happen, that is really easy. So, our grand summary here, know the challenges of chronic care and plan ahead. Get the right tools in your toolbox. Most people could qualify for long-term care medical if, unfortunately, they end up in skilled nursing and need to stay there. Know your rights in those facilities and how to get competent legal advice. So again, you've heard a lot of things today that uh, most people don't know, so I'm also deputizing you. If you're talking to somebody and they say, oh no, we would never qualify for any of those kind of help or programs, 
Just tell them, don't be so sure. Don't be so sure. Don't take your advice in this area from the people in the facilities of the district. I thank you all for coming today. Again, you're welcome to visit us. We will answer questions at the table.